Next up is Dr. Zach Phillips. He's one of the invertebrate conservation, terrestrial invertebrate conservation ecologists at the garden. And he studies interactions between insects, spiders, birds, and plants that can inform conservation strategies. As Zach says, as he tells it, when his friends and family members ask him to describe what he studied in grad school, he says, little arthropod guests of leafcutter ants called myrmecophiles. They usually respond, what? Come on up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, can everyone see the ants I'm holding up? It's uh, being decapitated by a fly. All right, All right. so uh, I think I'm cheating a little bit today because I'm talking about ants, and a single ant is pretty tiny, but a colony of ants is enormous, and I'm specifically talking about leafcutter ants. So this is the excavation of a cement cast of the internal architecture of one leafcutter colony. When it was alive, before it was turned into a sculpture, it probably had millions of ants in it. So in a sense, ants are tiny and big at the same time. Individual ants are small, but they come together collectively to form a superorganism or a colony that behaves like one large animal. Uh, and the ants in a leafcutter colony are like different cells or tissues of the colony. They come in different sizes and play different roles. So the left spiral is all of the workers in a leafcutter colony, going from the smallest worker to the largest at the top, which is called a soldier. And then the right column are the winged reproductives of the leafcutter colony, a male and a female. The one cast member that's not here is the queen of the colony. And the ants don't just cooperate with each other, they also cooperate with a fungus. They've evolved uh, a mutualism with a fungal garden, and the fungus and the ants are totally codependent on each other. The ants farm, or the ants uh, forage for plant material, bring it back to the colony, feed it to the fungus, and then the ants eat the fungus themselves. So this is a kind of agriculture that they've evolved. And it shouldn't be a surprise with colonies so big that they have big impacts. Um, a couple of these impacts are pretty obvious, like all the dirt they excavate out of the earth and the herbivory. And I think I should take this moment to apologize to the biocrust. I don't know what they're doing uh, and why they're doing it. Uh, but in the neotropics, leaf cutters alone make up 25% uh, of herbivory. But they also have less obvious impacts. Um, they provide resources to hidden communities. And two of these communities are the underground communities of animals that live in the nest themselves, and also nocturnal communities. And I'll be talking about that aspect of leafcutter ecology today, how they provide resources to these communities we don't often see, including in cities. So in the first part, I'll talk about an animal that lives in Austin, Texas, just in leafcutter colonies. And it'll be more of a research narrative, getting like a deep dive into one of these creatures. And then the second part will be more of a natural history account about all of my nighttime encounters with animals interacting with the colonies. So part one, investigating a cryptic ant guest. So before I came here to Santa Barbara, I went to grad school in Austin. And one of the great things about Austin is it celebrates its animals. Armadillos are an icon and part of the culture. The Congress Bridge bats are these bats that roost in the middle of the city and drop crowds of tourists and locals to watch feed in the evenings. One of the songbirds, Willie Nelson, <laughs> plastered all over the city. And Texas leafcutter ants also are there, but they're not as celebrated as those other Austinites. Um, these leafcutter ants are primarily distributed in Louisiana and Texas. There is one place in Austin that celebrates them, though, Brackenridge Field Lab. That's an urban field station, about 80 acres large. And this is one of my main research sites, so a lot of the observations I'll be talking about happened here. And the logo of the field station has a Texas leafcutter ant carrying a Texas-shaped leaf. And I also have a leafcutter testimonial, uh, not from leafcutters, but from a leafcutter biologist who worked at Brackenridge, uh, Deborah Waller. 
Uh, the first time I saw the leaf cutters, I felt part of the continuum of life, and Austin became a wonderful city to me with magical hidden secrets underground where the leaf cutters lived. One of those magical hidden secrets is a cockroach, uh, the world's smallest cockroach, Adaphila, about two to three millimeters long, so shorter than your typical grain of rice, and this is what I was studying. It's kind of a tiny taxon's tiny taxon, and it only lives in leaf cutter colonies, and mostly in the fungal gardens of the leaf cutters. It's probably more of a nuisance to the leaf cutters than a real problem, just like cockroaches are to us. Um, and I'm calling it an ant guest here, and that's just a broad term for any creature animal that lives with um, ants, which would include a lot of the flies. The roaches aren't the only insects that have evolved as ant guests. It's happened a lot with different insects. This is not a two-budded ant monster. Um, I'm not saying those don't exist. This just isn't one of those. This is a beetle that's posing at an, as an ant abdomen. So the beetle is the top part of the two butts, um, and it's just hitching a ride on this army ant. The roach also hitchhikes on ants, but it doesn't hitchhike on workers. It hitchhikes on the female alates, the winged reproductives of the leafcutter colony. So it's on the shoulder of the female alate at the base of the wing there. My research question was, why is it doing this? Or more specifically, how is it uh, dispersing between leafcutter colonies? How does riding these leafcutter uh, alates help the roach get to a new colony? And there's two different routes it might be using to do this. It could be riding the female alates to new newborn colonies, baby colonies that are just starting out, or it could be hitching these rides to get to larger, older colonies. And those two alternative routes are displayed here. And this is just another uh, schematic of that to show it in a different way. So going from a large colony to a baby colony vertically and horizontally between two large older colonies. So let's all pretend we're tiny roaches for a bit and we'll go through that first dispersal route. Um, it starts during leafcutter mating flights and the mating flights in Austin only happen once or twice a year in the spring when all the female and male alates come to the surface of the mound, along with almost all the workers defending their valuable alates, the roach just rides on the female alates. And this is a little video um, of the start of one of those flights. And at the end of it, one of the alates will land on my hand. You can hear the ants. Oops, I guess we could just watch that the whole time. Okay, um, after the female alates depart, to depart the nest, they mate mid-air with male alates from other colonies. Then they land, remove their wings, and they excavate a small sealed off chamber underground. And on that flight, they've carried a bit of fungal garden in their mouth in a special pocket, and they regurgitate that, and that's the starter garden for the new colony. And at that point, the female alate's called a foundress. It's the same ant, it's just a label uh, designating a different stage of colony development. And she's just alone in there for a few months, no workers at this point, and she has to take care of the garden and raise her first brood. And that's what I'm calling the newborn colony, just this foundress alone in that um, small cell. So that one ant can produce this colony, which can live over 10 or 20 years with the same, same queen living that entire time. So here is the beginning of what might be an ant empire. She's digging a new hole. Okay. So the roach hitchhiking behavior suggests that the roaches are riding these female alates to get to newborn colonies. That seems like the most straightforward reason. Why get on? the female alate if they're not going to stay with it. And that's just another depiction. And as a side note, this sort of dispersal from large colony to baby colony is a type of vertical transmission um, where a symbiont or a parasite is transmitted from a parent host to an offspring host. In this case, the parent host is the parent colony. The offspring host is the newborn colony. 
But there's some reasons to doubt that this is how the roaches are getting to new colonies. A big one is the vast majority of the founders die. It's like seeds being dispersed from a tree. Most of them get eaten or succumb to disease. So if the roaches stay with them, they would die too. Um, roaches abandon female alates in field experiments that we conducted. And we haven't found roaches with founderses. So there's not really any direct evidence that that happens. Also, in artificial chambers in the lab, the founderses attack the roaches and sometimes kill them. So in this one, the foundress, who's in the background, her giant mandibles, is going to attack the roach on the tiny little fungal garden, but she'll miss. Oops. All right. So let's look at the other route. Uh, the roaches using the female alates to ride to larger, older colonies. And this is plausible because female alates often land in the vicinity of large colonies, probably because they like the same type of habitat. Not because they want to be near them, because those large colonies will kill them if they find them. It's just they're both restricted to similar habitat. And here's another depiction of that. And this would be beneficial for the roaches, because they could bypass that likely to die stage of colony development. Um, and this is in that scenario, if the roaches were to do that, they might abandon the female alates after the mating flight, try to find a foraging trail, and use that foraging trail to get to the large colony. So I tested that um, with some droponomics. I dropped roaches on leafcutter foraging trails, and just to see if the roaches can use these foraging trails to get these colonies. This is what happened. You'll see the roach. It's going past the female alate that's being attacked by the colony and finding a worker. And it rides it back to the nest. And this is a close-up shot, a bit blurry. The roach is going to do a backflip onto a leaf that passes over it. Backflip. One more time. Back flip. Okay. Oops. Oh. I want to keep watching it. Um, so all of these observations combined suggest the roaches use two hitchhiking steps to move between colonies. First, they ride female alates to leave a colony, and then they hitchhike on a worker to get to another colony, called the Texas two-step. Okay. <laughs> So I'll end the first part with just a brief cockroach testimonial. Um, not all cockroaches are bad. That's the testimonial. Uh, and this is just a collage of a bunch of the cockroaches that make up about 5,000 species that aren't human pests. And only about 30 species are committed, considered human pests. OK, part two. So I spent a lot of time at the leafcutter col colonies at night, and they, they became sort of sit spots. Oh, in, this, in this picture, I'm wearing duct tape that's taped outwards to keep the leafcutter workers from attacking me for, or killing me. They still <laughs> attacked me. Um, so it became a sit spot, which is basically a, a favorite place in nature that you visit regularly. In this case, it was an insect-based sit spot. And it was a nighttime sit spot because uh, leafcutter ants are active at night. And this gave me an opportunity to see a type of ecology I don't usually see and most ecologists don't usually see. Ecology has a uh, nighttime problem or a nocturnal problem where the nighttime processes and activities are ignored compared to their daytime counterparts. And one of the main reasons that is, is ecologists themselves belong to a diurnal species. So we like to get a good night of rest. And here's just a leafcutter foraging line. The leafcutters turn to foraging at night during the warm season. Oop. OK. Uh, and leafcutter colonies also are hubs of nighttime activity for other animals because they're active at night. And I'll just take you few, through a few of the encounters I had with these animals and interactions they had with the colonies. 
So this is one of the most frequent nighttime visitors, um, a armadillo that would come to the nest, or armadillos that would come to nest to feed, not just on the ants, but on other insects that lived in the nest mounds themselves. And this is while I was standing on one of the mounds. Anytime I heard a loud, clumsy crashing through the forest, I knew it was an armadillo coming. Before I knew that, it was kind of frightening. Oh. Uh, this is a Texas blind snake. It's a snake that looks like an earthworm. It also feeds on ants and termites. And these would be traveling along foraging trails. And it uses, uh, to defend itself from ants, it covers itself in its own feces and other noxious chemicals. I didn't see that happen. And in the early mornings of mating flights, bats from Congress Bridge would come fly over the nests and eat a lot of the alates that were departing. When I first saw this on one of the leaf cutting uh, mounds, I, I thought I could make some money because if people like watching bats on the bridge, they'll love watching bats from nest mounds. And so I created Zach's Austin Bat Tours with ants. There are cockroaches too. <laughs> An immersive experience you won't get on a bridge. Uh, it didn't work out. But, uh, also flies. But these aren't flies like the Fords that specialize on the ants. They were just using the mounds opportunistically, probably because they liked the open patch of soil. So this is a little video of a crane fly that's laying its eggs into the nest mounds like a jackhammer. And this is a specialist uh, like the Adaphila roach that lives inside the colonies. This might be the only time this has been seen where the beetle's actually going into a colony. It doesn't live in the fungal gardens like the roach. It lives in the waste chambers underground. So even there's that much heterogeneity underground in the nest. It's like a little city with different neighborhoods that different animals take advantage of. And it somehow gets by the ants into the hole. You can see it's a lot larger than the workers, so it can probably only get into the nest during mating season because that's when the entrances are expanded for the alates. Uh, another master of ant evasion was this ant mimicking spider that also eats ants. Here it's standing over a leaf cutter, mid sized worker that it's just paralyzed and will start eating soon. And here it's interacting with a leafcutter soldier. And you'll see it touch the head and base of the antennae of the soldier, and it seems to be telling it, I'm an ant, don't attack me. Let's see. And the video I showed you before of the nocturnal foraging was actually the sp was spider focused. The spider's the protagonist of the video. It's running down the foraging trail of the leaf cutters. Uh, I didn't see Willie Nelson come crashing through my one animal. Um, now I work at Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and there aren't leaf cutters and I'd probably be fired if I brought them to the garden. Uh, but there are other types of hidden islands of biodiversity and those are shrubs and trees, large plants in general. Uh, these plants have insects and other invertebrates living on them and inside of them that we rarely see unless you look, like Erica was mentioning. Uh, and I call them the insects and the other tiny animals on there, plant guests. One of my personal favorites here is the coyote bush, which has um, the leaf beetle here eating on the outside, but also gall midges, type of tiny fly making galls on the inside of the plant. So one recommendation, uh, spend some time with a sit spot friendly insect spider or a community of tiny animals. And this can enrich your sense of place and home. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And a lot of, I'd like to thank a lot of the people in Austin and also Kevin Spraker from the garden who made that poster for me of the, uh, my failed business. So any questions? Yeah. When that nesting beetle goes into the colony, does it stay there for the rest of its life, or does it come back out when the 
probably comes out, but nobody knows. So the, it lays its eggs in the waste chambers. And there was a picture there, I didn't highlight, but in the corner, the larvae develop in the waste chambers and then they come out. So it probably doesn't, the adult uh, probably doesn't come back to the nest until it's gonna reproduce again. Sometimes these, these ant guests meet at nests to mate first. Um, so it could also have been going there to meet a mate. I don't know. A lot of, there's just a lot not known about these. I mean, you have to be out there staring at these colonies for an inordinate amount of time, sick amount of time. Yeah. Is the dark rover ant here in Santa Barbara? The dark rover ant, has it made it to Santa Barbara yet? I don't think so. I haven't heard anything from the ant community. <laughs> oh, has the dark rover ant made it to Santa Barbara? Ah, the fungal garden. I missed that. Yeah. So, well, we think it eats the fungal garden. So we did gut dissections, and there was some fungal garden in it. But there, you can also see it. It will go on large ants in the colony, and it looks like it might be licking substances off of them. So the roach could be beneficial to the colony also. Um, and even we don't know what parts of the fungal garden it's eating. It could be weeding the fungal garden. So I wouldn't call it a parasite because we just don't know what effect it has on the colony. And all, almost all of the roaches are female. Um, I've rarely, I've caught one male, I think, the whole time. And some colonies in Louisiana, it's all female, so they may have evolved to have lost males. Yeah. So I'm an ant guest just up in the <laughs> nice. um, What's the best way? <laughs> just like you, it's, uh, you're an ant guest just up the hill here, and you're asking what's the best way to cohabitate? Yeah. It's like building up an immunity. You just eat one ant the first day, a <laughs> few more ants the next. Just keep building. At the end, it's just a bucket of ants. Uh, yeah, it depends on the ants. I mean, learn to appreciate them, but also... Argentine ants can be difficult to appreciate because they destroy a lot of uh, habitat for other ants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the fungus that the, is cultivated by the ants. Um, clearly, it gets around or dispersed by the ants carrying a little piece of it and starting a new fungal colony that it then farms. Um, is there any evidence of sexual reproduction? I think in some abandoned nests, at some point people have seen actual fruiting bodies, but it's like a rare thing, yeah. Because all of the fungus' energy is going into creating these little food packets for the ants. That's part of their relationship, Gondolidia, yeah. Are there similar ant guests uh, uh, on things like the harvester mounds? Yeah, and actually, uh, one of my favorite local insects is a cricket ant guest um, that seems to be more of a generalist ant guest. It even cohabitates with Argentine ants. So if you, if, you look up, if you look under a log or a rock here and find any sort of ant colony, see if you see a little, it kind of looks like the roach. There's a lot of convergence in how these things evolve in terms of their shape and behavior. A little cricket-like thing hopping with the ants. Um, it's not as well adapted to live with the ants because you can see they're dodging ant bites a little more frequently, frequently than something like this that probably has a chemical profile that mimics the colony. It's another thing we don't fully know is how these roaches produce their chemical profile that mimics the colony. They could be absorbing a lot of it from the fungal gardens because um, they really have a relationship with both the ants and the fungus. That's not just a simple one way, it's a tripartite three-way relationship. If I made you guess, why would you have little pieces of moss? Uh, I mean, the, the, well, oh, if, if you made me guess, why would ants want little pieces of moss? Part of it could be con microclimate control in their nest, um, which a lot of ants do. I mean, leaf cutters, will, leaf cutters will use all kinds of plant material to grow fungal garden on. And I mean, I've seen them taking away meat from a dead armadillo too. I don't know what they were doing. 
don't know if that's for the fungal garden or for the workers directly, but maybe microclimate control. It depends on the ants. I know in Arizona, I don't know if they're up that far. There are leaf cutters in Arizona, but they're down in Tucson, mostly the Acromyrmex desert ones. And that's, I don't know if there's any in Flagstaff where you are. And that's where that was happening, right? Um, no, we saw this in Grand Rapids, New Mexico. Oh. Okay. Okay. Was it harvest strains? Maybe. Um, okay. Yeah, John. Just curious if there's any flies out there. If there are any? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, nope, haven't heard of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's the leaf cutters have fly decap decapitating ants. Yeah. Yeah, the flies associated with the ants are one of the coolest groups associated with the ants. This is just the roaches are some weird thing that only evolved with leaf cutters. And they're exclusively with leaf cutters, and they're the most successful. Um, ant guests with leaf cutters in the fungal gardens, at least. Yeah. How long can those cockroaches go without eating the little bit of stuff in the mouth? The fungus? How long can the roaches go without eating the, like, baby fungal garden? Well, if there's just this little bit in the mouth, yeah. they, they're going to have to wait for it to grow. Yeah, exactly. So that's another reason... There are a number of other reasons I didn't talk about why we think um, they wouldn't live with foundresses successfully. And one of the main ones is they seem to destroy the starter gardens. The roaches destroy the starter gardens, which is a catastrophe for everybody involved. The roach, the foundress, and the garden. Yeah. But if they, if they feed on like cuticular substances on the ant's skin, you could imagine the roach just lives off of the foundress until the garden's big enough. Hey, you saw that backflip. That takes a lot of brains. Yeah, yeah. It's like you can't do a backflip. I can't do a backflip like that. 